Okay, so good morning, everybody. My All right, for those of you, you who don't. Oh, sorry, Lauren. <laughs> sorry. I, will, I will just introduce myself and then I'll introduce you. But my name is Rita. I'm here from the Wood County Committee on Aging. And Lauren here is a naturalist from ODNR. And she has been doing these presentations for us every single month. And we're very grateful to you. But go ahead and take it away. All right. Yes, for those of you who don't know me, my name is Lauren Stewart, naturalist. I'm based out of Montmey Bay State Park. And today we're going to be talking about amphibians and no better day than a day like today to talk about amphibians with the, the rainy weather we're having. So oh, let me see if my PowerPoint will go. It's not wanting to go. Oh, there we go. What is an amphibian? So an amphibian basically means of two worlds. So an amphibian gets to have both the benefits of having a water-based life cycle but gets to go up on land as well. And they basically started to first emerge about 200 million years ago. And their whole complete life cycle starts with the water, ends on land, only to begin again in the water. So the most common when you're thinking of like animal life cycles and animal growth, you think of the frog life cycle and life stages. So we start with the eggs, we go to the tadpole stage with like the in-between look-ins when they're starting to get their little legs, when they're froglets, all the way to the adult, which is can be terrestrial. But we have a few other amphibians that kind of like to go back and forth. We have the red F, which we'll talk a little bit about the end, where it starts off in water, grows up a little bit, stays in water for a little bit, grows up, goes on land, and then goes back into the water as an adult too. So amphibians are a very interesting group of animals. Um, they're really noted by the fact that they have very, very thin skin. They can actually absorb oxygen through their skin. And a lot of our amphibians overwinter basically underneath ice in the water at the bottom of lakes and ponds, sometimes even in mud, and are able to get enough oxygen despite hanging out in that water and absorbing it through their skin. But on the downside of having this like high ability of this really good ability to absorb oxygen through their skin, that means they can absorb other things too, such as toxins in our water. And they're actually a very important environmental indicator. Um, they're one of the first to show issues in water quality because they are so sensitive to changes in the water because of their sensitivity of their skin. So if you have a pond that all of a sudden has a whole bunch of dead frogs in it, that means there's something in your pond that's in the water that is not good. So uh, sometimes a lot of people get amphibians and reptiles confused. Uh, the biggest thing is people like asking sna about snakes, are snakes slimy? So the biggest difference between reptiles and amphibians that is the most obvious is their feel. Amphibians are gonna have a slimy, moist skin. They are tied to the water, they are wet. Reptiles are gonna have a dry, scaly skin. Now, some amphibians tend to be a little bit more dry, but they're not going to have that scaly skin that reptiles do have. However, reptiles are going to have, if they have legs, unlike our snake friends, they're going to have claws versus no claws on amphibians. Um, both of them are cold-blooded and lay eggs, however. So first, we're going to start off with frogs. Um, this is actually, we are right at the beginning of the breeding season for some of our frogs. So we're starting to hear some frog calls and starting to hear territories set up. And when people think of amphibians, they're thinking of like, at least what comes to mind to me is a frog. A frog is the, the like source image of an amphibian. When, you th when you're looking up an amphibian, you're usually going to come across a frog. So... I'm going to go through and show you some different examples of our native frogs. So we have a few different ones that are most common. Um, at the very top, you'll see the northern green frog. These are one of my favorites. They get really large. So if any of you have ever had frog legs, you've actually eaten one of these two frogs, the northern green frog and the American bullfrog. So they can look very, very similar. As you notice, the green frog on top is green well-named. However, the bullfrog, also green. They can, both of them can vary in color. They can be bright, bright, almost like lime, key lime green, all the way through to almost like a muddy brown. But the biggest and easiest way to distinguish the two is if we actually look at behind their eye. So if you see that circle 
that's hanging out behind that bullfrog's eye and that northern green frog's eye, that's called their tympanum. That's their tympanic membrane, which is essentially their ears. So they need to have those ears to be able to hear those calls and whatnot, but they're not open hole like the reptile's ears tend to be if they do have ears. But the ridges really help us identify the difference between northern green and the American bullfrog. So if we look at the, the ridge that goes, the dorsal ridge that goes behind the eye in the northern green, it continues all the way down its back to where it gets the humps where its hits start. However, if you go down to the bullfrog, that ridge curls behind its tympanum, its tympanic membrane. It looks like it's tucking its hair behind its ears. So that's one of the easiest and quickest ways in the field to identify the northern green frog and the bullfrog separately. However, size is also a really good um, factor to, in, to kind of consider when you're looking at them. If the frog is absolutely huge, it's going to be a bullfrog. The bullfrog, the American bullfrog can get up to two and a half pounds. Um, amphibians in general are eating machines. They require live prey though. So their prey has to move for them to essentially to be able to see that it's food. And the Northern bullfrog, because it gets two and a half pounds, has a very varied diet and it can eat things that are rather large. Um, the amphibians are non-discretionary when it comes to what they eat. Uh, bullfrogs in that case are extremely so. Uh, they're cannibalistic, they'll eat each other, no problems. Um, so we, especially the nature center, when we have bullfrogs, we have to make sure we house them. If we have pairs, they have to be the same size. One can't be smaller. Otherwise we might end up with one slightly bigger bullfrog rather than having two. Uh, bullfrogs have been noted to eat things ranging from other frogs, insects, of course, small ducklings, snakes. They'll even eat squirrels, mice, if they can get a hold of. Um, our Northern bullfrog, our American bullfrog at the nature center, we have a large female. We will feed her leftover mice that are, they're frozen, they're not alive from the, from our snakes that didn't eat them. And we dangle them in front of her and she'll eat a whole mouse, no problem. They seriously, if it moves and it fits in their mouth, it's considered dinner to them. So I'm gonna play you the call of the Northern green frog. Uh, the easiest, quickest way to distinguish the difference between the two species is their calls. They are very, very different, even though they look similar in appearance. So here's the green frog's call. So the loud, like kind of trill in the background is actually a chorus frog, but if you heard the ding, dong, 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 it sounds like someone has an old banjo string that is not quite tuned that they're, they're flinging, flicking. And that is the Northern green frog. Someone has a rubber band or an old banjo and it's thunk, 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 versus our bullfrog, which you may know of like the bullhorn sound. It's a very robust, call, but that frog is also a very robust frog. Let me pull up our American bullfrog. It's a more a uh, 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 call. Oh, there's my green. Um, I don't have my call pulled up for one second. So I'm going to go on to the next one. I'll play you the bullfrog in a second. So we have a couple other frogs that are a little bit more, they're a lot, not a little bit smaller, they're a lot smaller. They're going to be about the size of your thumb and they look very similar. So the chorus frog, the mountain chorus, and the spring peeper. Uh, the spring peeper is actually one of our first call frogs to call in the wintertime or the early spring, late wintertime, depending on where you are in Ohio. They have a, um, the spring peepers have the almost like jingle bells when they're in a large group, they have, they're well named because they, they literally peep, they go like peep, 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 peep. And when you get a whole group of these frogs together, they uh, sound just like someone's like sleigh bells jingling together. It's, it's very, very, very interesting one. Let me pull up that bullfrog call. However, the mountain chorus frog, even though they look very similar to that spring peeper, you're looking at their brownish, grayish, their little bit markings, they're well camouflaged frogs they have a completely distinct call. They don't have that high kind of shrill pe peeping. They sound like they're in a chorus. They sound like a typical frog, not quite the croak, 
but almost a rivet in a chorus. But let me do that bullfrog call really quickly. And it's gonna go. So bullfrogs don't start calling, they don't start mating until later in the year. So you're gonna hear the green frogs earlier than the bull. Bull horn sound. It is very loud and it carries great distances. Now the chorus frog has that distinct frog sound to it, but they aren't quite as shrill as the spring keeper. So let me pull up that chorus frog call. Here's our chorus frog. That's our chorus frog versus our spring keeper. So a very distinct difference in calls, even though the frogs look very similar. Um, that them both being smaller than your thumb makes them a little harder to identify in the field. They are quick to jump. They never want to hang out for one place very long because they are on the menu for a lot of different animals. But if you get a close look, you can tell the difference between the two because the spring peepers are going to have an X on their back. So they're both gonna have that kind of mottled coloration, but the spring peeper gets that distinct X. But however, the easiest way to find these frogs is based off of their call, and that's how you can identify them as well. So up in the Northwest, we're gonna get the Northern Leopard Frog. And they sound, they're actually very, very common. If you go to Mommy Bay State Park, the three most common frogs we get there are the Green Frog, the Bullfrog, and the Northern Leopard. Um, the Northern World Leopard are going to be common in the northern half of the state, which is their name is indicates that the pickerel frog is going to be more common in the southern half of the state. However, they look very similar. Now, I'm saying like, well, we're looking at this, this, this frog, they look different. They have the, one of them looks like basically they took all the green away from it and that was what was left over. The Northern Leopard frog can actually be that brown as well. Uh, the biggest difference is visually the pickerel frog is going to have that kind of yellowish belly as well as the northern frog has a very distinct ridge and all of its spots are basically going to be gold line or highlighted line there's going to be a lighter color around those dark spots and if you look at the pickerel frog they have the black that lines it their calls are different as well the northern leopard frog sounds almost like a creaky door it's like versus the pickerel frog. So we're gonna play the pickerel frog first. It's a lower, more guttural. The pickerel frog is not musical sounding. Well, the Northern leopard frog has a little bit more flair to its call. There's a Southern leopard frog, a plain leopard. Here's our Northern. This one's a really low one, but there we go. He has his, they almost sound like they're grouchy. It's a grouchy kind of call to them to bring in the females versus the pickerel is just kind of almost mechanical sounding. Now when they're in large groups, it literally sounds like when they're calling, when they're doing their big, big mating groups, it actually sounds like you're standing in traffic when they're all calling at once. Uh, about three years ago, we had just an incredible boom in our amphibian population. We had a really mild winter and we had tons of water in the marsh. And with that, our frogs just exploded. And they all, a lot of them survived the winter time because it wasn't super cold. And so everybody, when they were all there, there was a whole, the population was large. The, call, the calls were just crazy. It, you could literally, when you opened your car door, it was almost sounded like you're standing in the middle of the highway in I-75. It was, so when they're in big groups, they could be very, very loud. Question here. Spring peeper, yes. I don't know if I accidentally wrote pepper on there, but yes, it's peeper, like they're peeping. So, sorry, 
my thing is freezing a little bit today. So the northern leopard frog is another one that's going to be more common. Now, our very first frog to emerge in North America is the wood frog. These guys are super duper cool. Now, frogs have a, a, a ability to kind of survive in the wintertime because you're thinking they're cold blooded. So they cannot regulate their own body heat, which means that when it's freezing outside, they are freezing. However, the wood frog has a little trick with it. Basically, it's able to process its urine, its uh, excretions from its kidneys differently and basically turn it into antifreeze. So they live as far north as Alaska, which gets very cold in the winter. And they can actually have 65% of their body freeze with no cell damage. As long as their core organs do not freeze, they're fine. But 65% of their body, basically, they can be a frogsicle almost and still be able to merge relatively unscathed. Um, they have a distinct mask on behind their eyes. That is the, their biggest. So they don't, they're not gonna have a lot of mottled colors, but they're gonna have this really distinct mask. So they emerge pretty early here. You might get them as early as March. However, in Alaska, they emerge as late as June, just because it takes that long for it to get warm enough for them. And the Western chorus frog can be kind of confused with that. They have this dark mask, but they are, it's not going to be quite as distinct as the wood frogs is. So the wood frog has their claw call is more like a clop, 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 clop versus the Western Chorus, which actually have amazing camouflage. You hardly ever get to see them. They have more, it sounds like someone's taking a plastic comb and running something hard along it. So I'll play our Western Chorus frog. So someone's taking that comb versus our wood frog. The ones that just have are so crazy well adapted to living in cold areas. They must sound kind of like chickens, it's like angry little, little flustered hens. So these two are very interesting. Um, the Cope's gray tree frog and the gray tree frog. So they're almost impossible to tell the difference between uh, visually. So sometimes you can look at the markers along their face that basically look kind of like their lips have, has, does have differences between them. Uh, basically the only surefire way to determine the different species, it's not visual, it's actually they have to look at, they look at their blood. The Cope's tree, gray tree frog has bigger red blood cells, but they are completely different species. They, are, they have diverged, they are not the same species, they don't interbreed, and their calls are a little bit different as well. So here's the gray tree frog call. not going to play for me. So the great tree frogs, they're very musical. Um, they are true. When we say tree frogs, they are truly going to be in the trees. They're going to be in the bushes. Um, they have a slower call than the copes, the copes great tree, but the copes great tree, you're going to find more in Southwest Ohio versus the gray are going to be throughout. So I'm going to look up the call for those really quickly. My link is not working. Here's the copes. Let me see if I can get my copes to work. Nope. Oops, gray tree frog. But they are, you're going to, you're going to hear these guys more than you're going to see them. They are uh, very, very loud though when they're calling. Let me see if I pull up the call. What's up, guys? Stanley oh. with Catching Creek. I heard them this close to me. Jacob. Brr, brr. That's the copes. He's going to be slower versus the gray tree frog, which is going to be even more delayed. But as you can see, they're both very hard to distinguish from each other just visually. Here's our gray tree frog. Oh. Everything has to have ads now. There we go. So 
So as you notice, the copes has, it's more mechanical sounding versus the gray is gonna have a more musical tune to it. So the spade foot toad, these guys are wonderful. Um, they're very, very cute, very, very small. Um, they are gonna be more underground versus the cricket frog, which I love the cricket frog's call. It sounds like somebody is taking two rocks and just knocking them together. It's a clunk, 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 clunk. It sounds very distinctive, like rocks being knocked almost underwater. Versus the Eastern Spade Foot, which actually kind of sounds like a cat. Let me pull up our frog calls again. The uh, cricket frog is just a, such a distinct one. You, you typically tend to hear them later in the summertime. They are, uh, but they're, even though they're not, these frogs are very small, that sound carries so well. Here's our, we'll do the spade foot toe, which sounds more like, like a cat first. It almost is a meow sound. They kind of sound like an apathetic frog. Okay, I guess I'll croak. And then our cricket frog. The very loud. I'm kind of like shaking rocks in a glass jar in this one. So the interesting thing about the frogs, the colder it is, the slower they're going to call. So early in the season, those spring peepers, rather than cheep, 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 are going to be beep, beep, beep. But as it gets warmer, they'll be calling faster because they are cold-blooded animals. So just depending on the temperature can actually really influence how their calls sound as well. So that's something to consider. Both the Eastern Cricket Frog and the Eastern Spadefoot Toad are going to be very small. However, the cricket frog is going to have a much more brown coloration to it, and it's actually going to look more bumpy than the eastern spade foot toad. Now, the eastern spade foot toad is going to be very rare. They're actually um, endangered here in Ohio, but they're going to have more the, like, their eyes are very, very bulgy. They're very distinct, but they're burrowing, so we're not as likely to see them. Um, and the cricket frogs are going to be found on the western side of Ohio, so we're in the perfect spot to hear even though it says Eastern cricket frogs, they're found in the Western side of Ohio. They like the more open areas. So toads. So you may be thinking, well, it said spade foot toad. The spade foot toad is actually a true frog versus toads being a little bit more distinctive. Toads are gonna have the drier skin and they're gonna be a lot more terrestrial. So we have two toads here in Ohio, Northwest Ohio. We have the flowers toad, fowler's toad, excuse me, and the American toad. The American toad by far is gonna be the more common toad that you see. So the American toad actually has a really beautiful trill. You'll hear that starting in May. It's a, a long trill that they just go and go and go and go versus the spade foot toad, which actually sounds like a nasally version of the trill, but it's a more. So I'll play you the American toad call. And then our much more uh, dramatic space foot toad call, or not space foot toad, sorry, Fowler's toad. <laughs> and you can hear in the background, there are some spring peepers that deep, deep, deep as well. Um, American toads can get fairly large, and a lot of people look at them and they're like, well, don't toads cause warts? Why would you want to handle them or pick them up? So these bumps on the back of their toads, which actually help distinguish toads from frogs, is they're actually paratoid glands. And these glands produce bufotoxin. So if you've ever had a dog pick up a toad and all of a sudden it's like mouth is like foamy, the dog starts throwing up, that's what the toxin actually can cause irritation in the stomach and causes the irritation in their mouth, which makes their mouth foam. Um, so toads are actually poisonous. So the difference between poisonous and venomous, a venomous animal has to bite or sting you versus a poisonous animal, you have to eat or touch it. So when
when you handle toads, you actually want to make sure you wash your hands really well. And that's for all, handling all wild animals. And, and another thing to consider when you're handling amphibians, you have oils and dirt on your hands that actually transfer through their skin. So you want to make sure that you handle amphibians as little as possible. Toads are a little bit more hardy when it comes to handling, but you got to remember they're poisonous. Um, and it makes sense for them to be poisonous. They rely mostly on camouflage to hide from potential predators. However, they have really tiny legs. They're not, they're, they're more like little hoppers. They're not leapers by any means. They're not a very fast moving on land, but they're pretty good swimmers in the water, but they're still a lot more awkward than some of our other amphibian species. So the toads are poisonous. Yep. So yeah, they don't, they don't cause warts. It actually, it's a myth. It's a virus that causes the warts, but uh, however, they are poisonous. So you still want to wash your hands regardless. Delay in this. Um, toads are actually one of the reasons why I became a biologist uh, when I was a little girl. I loved looking for toads in my yard and it was actually the Gulf Coast toad because I'm originally from Texas that which looks very similar to the American toad that basically inspired me to get into science and biology. I try to always find them and look the little sewer lids and whatnot and my mom had to actually check my pockets to make sure I didn't have any before I came inside because that was one of my things I like to put the toads in my pocket because I wanted to take them in and they wanted them to be my pets but now as an adult I know they belong in the wild while animals belong there. So amphibians, as I mentioned, frogs, toads, and you. So as I mentioned, that they're actually environmental indicators. Um, they can tell us if our water is bad. Um, however, they also are really important to the ecosystem. A majority of what they're eating is insects. So if we did not have frogs and toads, we'd have a lot of undesirable insects to deal with. So they're, they're very, they have a very important role in the ecosystem. Here, the amphibians aren't going to hurt us. We don't have any, we don't have any poison dart frogs or anything like that. Now, the, the toads are poisonous, but not many of us are going to go and try to eat toads. Our dogs may, but we're not. Um, and some of them, some frogs can actually provide food. If you think about the bullfrogs, if you ever had frog legs, you've had food from a frog and they get big enough that it definitely is, is a big enough meal for sure. But their role in the ecosystem is super important because of the fact they help us control the insect population. So that's just something to consider that providing habitat for amphibians is actually really important. Um, they're one of the most threatened, threatened group of animals worldwide um, because it's just, they're so tied to water quality. And when the water quality goes down, which normally it does, the closer we get to human habitat, humans tend to degrade the water quality that we lose a lot of our frog species. And some of them have such thin margins, which places they, they can live can really affect um, whether or not their species is able to survive. Um, many of our frog species depend on something that's called vernal pools. So they're ephemeral, meaning they're only around for a certain amount of time. And it's usually in the spring, basically when the snow melts and it's in areas that uh, are low lying, that water collects and a lot of frogs breed in there. It, but that area doesn't hold fish or any of the larger predators that we find in, in a continuous bodies of water like ponds. So they rely on these vernal pools in the springtime to breed because they can't breed in normal ponds because there's too many predators for their tadpoles and for their eggs. And when they when we lose habitat, we lose wetland habitat in areas that may have vernal pools. We lose actually a good portion of our frog species as well as our salamander species, which I'll be talking about in a minute. So that's just a thing to consider is providing habitats for frogs. So if you have a low-lying area, providing a rain garden or a small shallow pond is highly recommended and you will be able to get in natural insect control and some beautiful sounds sometimes in the summer as well as they're getting ready to breed. So salamanders. Here in Northwest Ohio, we don't have the best uh, viewing of salamanders. They, a lot of salamanders preferred like more heavily wooded areas. We don't have a lot of densely wooded areas that are wet um, anymore. We do have some like Ball Woods has salamanders and some parts of like if you go towards Harrison Lake, we'll have some as well, but it's sometimes hard to find salamanders in this region. Oak, open, Oak Openings does for sure. And so does Wildwood Metro Park. I have seen some there, but at Mommy Bay, it is almost impossible. I've never been able to find salamander. It doesn't mean that they're not there. 
but we do not have a dense population. Part of it is because we're continuously inundated with water and we don't have wet woods that completely dry out. So here's some salamanders that you can find in Ohio. Uh, they are highly varied in color and a lot of them are poisonous to other animals or they pretend they're poisonous. Um, and those are warning colorations. Usually the brighter color they are, they, they tend to be more toxic. Now the blue spotted, marbled and spotted. So the spotted is gonna be the most brightly colored one that's commonly seen. Um, they get rather large. And the thing about salamanders, they're amphibians. They have this similar life cycle to the frogs, starting off in water, having a larval form in the water, and then moving terrestrially as an adult. Um, the mole salamanders are actually unisex. They do not, they can actually breed without males. They can kind of do, um, oh, I can't remember the scientific word, para or something, but basically they can actually, they don't need a male to breed a lot of times. So they're very, very interesting species. And as mole might indicate is when they become terrestrial, they go subterranean, they wanna be back underground. Vernal colds, yeah, Colin Park used to have some as well. Yes, yeah, they, um, so adding vernal pools is really important. Pearson Park, Metro Park actually has some as well. Um, but creating or leaving areas that would have rural pools is really important, especially in Northwest Ohio, because so much of our um, original land has been turned to agriculture or uh, has been urbanized uh, and, and basically um, is more human habitat than animal habitat. So yes, it's very important. And uh, we actually have an H2O grant, H2O Ohio grant that through the governor's office that is working on um, upping the water quality and vernal pools and rain gardens are part of that as well. PowerPoint is so delayed today. So um, as you can see, they are very varied in color. And a lot of them are actually well named to how they look. Like the marble, the small mouth actually has a very, very tiny mouth spotted in blue spotted Eastern tiger are all well named. My next slide is, oh, there we go. Green cave, two lined, Northern dusky mountain dusky, long-tailed, again, all named. Our salamanders are highly variable. There's actually a really good guide on, from the Division of Wildlife that I'll actually send to you, Rita, if anyone's interested. It's a PDF. Um, they do have print copies. You do have to request them if you'd like a print copy, but uh, it's very interesting. It tells you where each of these animals are distributed and where best you can see them as well. Then we have the northern red, board toad. See, you can see they have just highly variable in, in color and in um, size, shape, and form. I love that northern slimy. I just think it's hilarious that they're like, yep, this is slimy. It lives in the north. I'm gonna call it the northern slimy. And these are very interesting ones, the mud puppy and the eastern hellbender. So there's a lot of recovery efforts for the eastern hellbender. That's gonna be our largest salamander species that you see. Um, they are well named because they have uh, quite the attitude. They get very large. Um, they could be, they don't want to be moved, but they're going to live in fast moving, clear, very good, high quality water. So um, they actually have recently one was found over in Mohican uh, at the clear fork of the Mohican River, which um, they knew they probably were over there, but it actually a citizen was able to confirm. They took a picture, sent it to division, and it was very exciting over there. So they're making a lot of recovery efforts, especially with the Eastern Hellbender themselves. So the red spotted newt has a very interesting phase. Um, they essentially can, they have two different versions. They have a larval form, they have a terrestrial adult form, and then another adult form that essentially ends up, they're gonna be more tied to the water. So they, so just amphibians have a very, different life cycles than the mammals do. So they are, um, as you can see, the red eft form when it's more terrestrial is well named just because they have that bright red color versus when they turn into the full adult back towards more aquatic stage, they look almost completely different, but you can kind of see how they're tied with those red spots on their back as well. So salamanders, um, 
the best thing if you're looking for salamanders here in northern northwestern Ohio, the redback salamanders is going to be the one of the easiest ones you can find. They come in two phases: redback or leadback. Which leadback is actually that gray? They have a gray back instead of that kind of a more brickish red. Um, Oak Benin region is one of the best places I've been able to find them, and they like to live in moister areas as the adults, so you don't have to look under logs and things like that. Now, salamanders can get pretty big, like the hellbender, which is going to be like two to two feet long. They're more like 18 inches to 12 inches um, versus the redback salamander, which is going to be more like the length of your finger. So unlike reptiles, they're going to be slimy. They're going to be, they're not going to have any of the scales. They're not going to have any claws. So when you do handle amphibians, what we always recommend is to get your hands wet. That helps protect them from the oils as well as it helps keep their skin moist. So we're not contaminating the skin with the dirts and oils in our hands and we're helping them keep their skin up to condition. Um, most amphibians are covered with basically a slime coat, a mucus coat to help keep their skin moist and help keep everything going and keep them um, from getting fungal infections and continuous handling by people can actually remove that mucus layer, that slime layer and open them up to fungal infections as well as whatever we have in our hands can contaminate them. Um, a big thing that people don't realize hand sanitizer is actually really, really bad for them. So if you want to handle an amphibian, you never want to put hand sanitizer on before you handle it. It actually could kill them, especially the smaller ones like the salamanders, which can be super sensitive. So I know that was a lot of information about amphibians, but since we're talking about marshes and vernal pools, I'm going to mention some other marsh inhabitants that you might encounter when you are um, looking for amphibians. So the big difference between reptiles and amphibians are that, again, that scale, the scaly skin, they're not slimy, but a lot of reptiles use the same habitat that the amphibians are. And a lot of reptiles use the same habitat because they're eating the amphibians. So reptiles are gonna have a close association with vernal pools um, and they're gonna take advantage of the ecosystem and the habitat there, just like the amphibians do. So the spotted turtle, it's one of them. We're very fortunate in northern Ohio that we can see these guys. Uh, they are absolutely adorable. They um, a big issue they encounter is they're threatened by the pet trade. So uh, because they look so interesting and they stay small, they're highly desirable for illegal collection. So that's a big issue they face, as well as losing their wetland habitat. Um, they feed a lot in vernal pools. They're getting those macro invertebrates that are hanging out in the vernal pools to breed. So they, they use those greatly. Uh, they're gonna be found in wet woods. So where the vernal pools will be and we can find them in marshy areas as well. The ribbon snake and the garter snake. Up here, um, even though the ribbon snake is in our area, we're more commonly gonna find the Eastern garter snake. Um, so the garter, Water snakes are, are actually related, closely related to the water snake. They're primarily going to be eating amphibians and fish. So they're eating frogs, tadpoles, and fish. However, garter snakes have a more variety, varied habitat. They'll tolerate going farther away from water by all means because they're not tied directly to water like amphibians are. They'll also eat insects and small mammals. Um, versus the ribbon snake, which is much more tied to vernal pools and the more aquatic areas. But garter snakes, you can find a lot farther away from water than ribbon snakes. Um, there's also a morph of the garter snake that you can see, especially around the Great Lakes region, and it is a melanistic version. So the garter snake's actually in the top. If you look at the snake, it, the melanistic version is basically going to be an all black version of a garter snake. Same exact species, it just, um, it actually helps them get quicker to breed because the lake tends to keep it cooler here in spring. So since they're cold blooded, they can only move quickly if the temperature is warmer, so they are that darker color to be able to absorb the sunlight better, to get to breed, to get to eat, all that fun stuff faster because they tend to emerge. Actually, the garter snakes started emerging when we had this nice warm spell of weather.
So any venomous animals, thankfully in Northwest Ohio, we're super lucky that we don't have any venomous animals, uh, really snakes to worry about. So there is the Northern Massasauga rattlesnake or the swamp rattler. However, they really haven't been seen in Northwest Ohio uh, since like the mid eighties. So technically they could be here, but it's not something you're really gonna have to worry about. Um, the Northern water snake is non-venomous. However, it's not a snake that I'd recommend you pick up and handle. Um, it's almost one of the snakes that I can almost guarantee you'll get bit just because they are a little more defensive. Um, and they have kind of a shorter margin of how they can survive because they're, they're feeding off fish. There's a lot of energy to get, get that bit, those fish and the frogs that they're eating. Um, but they're not venomous. So you might get bitten by one, but you're, the only thing is going to happen to you, you're just bit by a snake. They're not really large enough that they're going to do significant damage. But as always, if you're bitten by something, you want to make sure you wash your hands because um, you don't know what the animal has been around. The most snakes and most of the animals here in this area, specifically the um, reptiles, uh, they're going to try to avoid us more. They're, they're not going to be aggressive. It's only the only real way that you're going to be bit is a defensive mechanism. They accidentally got stepped on. You accidentally touched it. You picked it up on purpose, things like that. So don't really have to worry about many venomous things here. Now, as you get towards Southern Ohio, you have the copperhead and you have the um, timber rattlesnake as well. So the copperhead, the main issue with the copperhead is they have such good camouflage, accidentally stepping on them is really the main way that people get bit. And the timber rattlesnakes will warn you, hence the rattle, but again, they have fairly good camouflage as well and that they are venomous, but they are not this far north in this area of Ohio. So um, again, if you go to Maumee Bay State Park, the Eastern Garter Snake is going to be one of these snakes, one of the most common snakes you'll see. PowerPoint just doesn't want to cooperate today. Absolutely. I'm going to stop the share real fast and see if it will unfreeze. All right. Well, does anybody have questions or comments you'd like to? Oh. Yeah, it's oh, my, sorry. my okay, PowerPoint thought... is freezing. I have a couple. Oh, more. is that what you're doing? I okay. was stopping it real fast to see if it would go, but it doesn't want to. Um, but we do have a couple other animals that are common in the marsh. The uh, Blanding's turtle is another one. They look, uh, they have like this dark shell, but they have a bright yellow neck. Uh, they actually breed at Mommy Bay State Park. It's one of the few places you can easily see them as well as Mickey Marsh. The Midland Painted Turtle, very common there. And our kind of our showstopper is the Eastern Fox Snake. They are only found in a few counties in Northwest Ohio and just a couple counties in Southeastern Michigan. That's the only places you can find that uh, snake basically anywhere. So we're very, very fortunate to have those guys at Mommy Bay State Park. And they're very much tie closely tied to marshy areas where amphibians are found. So those are some other animals you could encounter. And since my PowerPoint doesn't want to cooperate today, do we have any questions? Yeah, sometimes with my PowerPoint, it does that too. It doesn't let me move forward. So, but yeah, does anybody? Yes, yeah, doesn't want to go forward today. <laughs> anybody have any follow-up questions or comments you would like to ask Lauren? I just have a comment uh, here in North Toledo. Uh, I don't know if you knew it or not, Lauren, but part of the Metro Park system, uh, we have a preserve now called Manhattan Marsh Preserve that just opened a few weeks ago. Oh, and, oh yes, yes. I knew they were getting close to opening. Yes. Yes, and we're look, we're looking forward to seeing some of these amphibians and, and reptiles. Uh, not yet. Well, we've been going there quite often. Oh, good. But so far, all 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 we've seen is a few birds and uh, a lot of Canada geese. Oh, yeah, they always, the Canada geese seem to be the first ones to come right. to we anything saw, that has water. We saw about 20 of them last week, but they were mostly in pairs, which, yes. we, which yeah. we thought was kind of unusual. But maybe They're not. getting ready to start breeding, so they've all paired off. Oh, I see. That, that, yes. that, that explains um, it. I just started hearing the chorus frogs start calling. 
Um, and that's a little early, but that's because, I mean, it was 70 something degrees yesterday. So all the other frogs are like, oh, what's going on? Okay, I'll start. Um, but since we're gonna get a little bit of a cold snap, we'll start, it'll be slowing down on the frog calls. However, the spring peepers are really gonna start. The wood frogs are gonna start. And sometimes the gray tree frogs tend to start early as well. So um, I heard actually a northern leopard frog mixed in with the chorus frogs, which is really early for the northern leopards. Normally they don't start till mid-April. So when we have warm weather though, they just take advantage of it by all means. Um, <clears throat> I do have some news about the Nature Center for those who are interested. Uh, we are probably, op we're opening up sometime in May. Right now, tentatively May 5th, but um, we will potentially be be opening up sometime in May. We don't know the exact date, but we're we're targeting hopefully around biggest week in birding. That's very exciting. Yeah. When, when, when does the birding season start? The, the immigrant, the, the, uh, the migrating the birds. Uh, the first and second week in May. So oh, um, okay. they're not doing the festival this year, but we anticipate there's going to be a lot of birders since. Um, most people are getting their vaccines, yeah. and by that portion of May, a majority of those that come bird that the yeah. age group that comes birds are going to be vaccinated. So we're assuming that um, we're going to get quite a few birders, even though the festival yeah. isn't official this year. Do you think the Metzger Marsh boardwalks will be open this year? Um, that I don't know. Um, I know our boardwalk is going to be open. I mean, they get, they sure. get pretty crowded during the uh, migration. Yeah, so I don't know if they're going to be open, but I know Mommy Bay's oh, will be. Okay. Um, and then I'm assuming Howard Marsh's, their small little boardwalk will be open. Like all the Metro Parks should be open. Uh -huh. And um, Oak Openings and Pearson's always oh, a good sure. place to go birding as well. Right. Ah. I want to say this, that your sound effects were just terrific. Thank you. I wish they were, I had them all lined up and my phone was like, no, we're not going to load. And my PowerPoint was like, no, we're not going to go forward. It wasn't a good technology day. But um, I'm actually going to send uh, Rita the link to the amphibians guide from the Division of Wildlife, as well as the link to all those frog calls. So you can get, you can hear those on your own. It's actually the Division of Wildlife for Indiana that has the calls laid out, but um, they, we're going to have the same species especially us being in Northwestern Ohio, we're gonna share most of the species there. So it's a really good link, has the, uh, a lot of different frog calls on there. So you can get an idea of what you can hear and what they sound like. But just remember it is very temperature based because they, they just, if it's really cold, they're gonna sound really slow, but if it's hot, they're gonna sound fast and high pitched. So. Wow. Us. That's very cool. Well, thank you so much for Absolutely. joining us. And this was thank you for you your know, patience today yeah. with the technology not wanting to cooperate. Yeah, I think that this group in particular knows how it goes, right? Like this is a new world for us, and some days technology cooperates, and sometimes it doesn't. <laughs> so thank you again. Well, for I appreciate your patience, regardless. <laughs> Everybody, I hope you have a wonderful day. Thank you very much. Have a great day. Bye. Bye. Bye.